OK, Ben, three. We can't. OK, OK. OK. We're going to start. So I hope there seem one or two people who uh, haven't yet got a seat. Okay. Uh, the packed audience, which is getting rarer and rarer, uh, is a tribute to the pleasure and interest we have in Ben coming to lecture. He says he was here about two or three years ago. Uh, ben, of course, was uh, a student at the AA, and then a teacher. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure there will be some ex-students of his in the audience this evening, um, because he was, at that time, uh, one of the most interesting and creative teachers uh, in the AA, and a lot of people uh, are very conscious of how much they owe to his teaching. Then, as you all know, I don't know why I'm saying all this, I mean, founded UN Studio with the work that that's done, and sort of ended up running the Stadel Schule and now teaching uh, at, I believe the place is called Harvard. Um, <laughs> it's sort of on the right-hand side of America. Uh, he's going to talk this evening uh, about the Arnhem Railway Station, which is a project which actually most of your professional career you've been involved in. Uh, so it's a, a long labor. Um, ben also said that, uh, unlike some lectures and their aftermath, he would really welcome uh, contributions, you know, in the form not just of questions like how old are you or where's your next building uh, so think about it while the lecture is going on and we welcome kind of contributions afterwards so with me i'd like you to welcome ben Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah. That, that's how I like it lately, uh, not to talk longer than 40 minutes. Uh, it's not due to my voice. Um, um, if you can't hear me in the back, then it's uh, due, to the, due, due to the Dutch weather, because it's been quite uh, bad over the last uh, few uh, uh, months. Um, so, 45 minutes. Uh, um, so, so, what I will do is um, talk about the Arnhem train station. Can we dim the light more? Yeah. yeah. The Arnhem uh, Central Station. And, and, and I'm particularly interested to, um, to talk about um, mobility and, and transport um, while, while talking about this, uh, this project we, uh, we worked on for close to 20 years. Um, and I wrote an, a little short text before I came here and, and, and just read this. Uh, for me, um, mobility is related, as I said, to so many things. Life is fundamentally shaped by mo mobility, you could say. People spend much of the time in transit 
And so does everything around them, slow, rapid, invisible, disruptive. The current sustaining or living patterns are multimodal, multidirectional, and in our time are also faster and wider reaching than ever before when we talk about mobility. And, and that's why I'd like to start with, with the way how, how we talked about mobility before and how, how for instance, in Holland, the, the whole excitement around uh, using the train what, what was quite uh, a complex system to, to work with because the Dutch were not so interested in this, what they call the iron road crossing the lands of owners who were um, saying, well, you just go around my land if you are having interest in, in uh, uh, moving around people, um, but, but don't, um, don't, don't cross my land. And this idea of uh, resilience, political resilience, and, and, uh, and, 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 and a kind of uh, public resilience was in that time uh, quite intense. And I'm talking here about the mid-19th century. But if we go back to the history and, and a bit more earlier history of the, the phenomenon of traveling, we all know how exciting, especially in the industrial age, um, how exciting one became about traveling. The optimism of leaving and departing, this, this, the notion of the spectacle, this whole f phenomenon of the uplifting quality of, the, of traveling was, was celebrated so intensely, not only in, in, in architecture as we know, like we can see here in the Grand Central Station or in the in Houston Station <coughs> in London, but was uh, actually demolished in the 1960s, but, but it was also coming back in in the movies, paintings, like, for instance, as we know it from the Futurist. This, all these ideas were fascinating me so much when we worked on, on the Arnhem train station, and I'm talking now about the 1919, close to 1996, when we started a, a, an analysis of the site, where we dealt with um, a lot of resilience, <laughs> actually. Um, this was the entrance tunnel towards two bus stations. The square was asymmetrically placed, so, so people didn't know where to step over and how, and didn't know where to wait. When they were not sometimes only waiting for the, the or either the trolley bus, what is an electrical bus, maybe you know these uh, buses, but they were also waiting for the, the train sometimes because the train station was too small. So when we were asked to rethink the, 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 the train <coughs> station area, then the, the railroad uh, um, department uh, were saying, well, we are not interested in thinking about the city site. We want our station on this side, and whatever the city is going to do with their site, we, we are not interested in. So, I mean, it was an incredible political a fight we had with, with, with not only the rail uh, uh, department, but also with the way how we could convince uh, many parties to discover that, that it was not ground value what was the most important way to think of, because, I mean, that was the argument, we, this is our ground and that's your ground. We argued that, that there were so many stepovers between the two bus stations already in, in the 80s and the 90s that... Um, that the stepovers of the two bus stations were higher than the movement between the train station and the city centre, for instance. And we argued that if you would have a shop or any kind of commercial entity related to your tunnel or entrance of the um, um, platforms, you would have no people because they will wait all day or they will not be connected. So the argument was like, like a shop. If you have a beautiful shop on a fantastic ground, but you have no people, then you have no shop. So, so we argued for people make ground value. And, and after many discussions and many diagrams we produced, um, 
we, we could find a an, an system of arguing that this site needed a transfer uh, location instead of only a, a, a train station. So by introducing a, a parking for the bikes, actually there are so many bikes coming to this station, I, I, I think we have now around 4,000 bikes coming to the train station and have parking places for them or, or, uh, underneath this part of the transfer uh, location or the transfer hall as we call it right now. Um, and of course the two bus stations generate an incredible amount of movement between not only the bike entrance, but we also introduced uh, a an, an car park underneath the whole site in order to make sure that everyone coming to the site uh, would be able to uh, directly have a connection towards the, the train platforms. And what we did was to use the, all these movements, all these entities of movements, we used in a way by using the natural um, landscape of Arnhem. And you know, maybe in Arnhem, um, there is some movement in, in, the, in the city. Um, there is a high difference, for instance, in or side, but from one point to the other, but well, it's almost close to seven meters. And don't forget, every Dutchman is happy with, uh, with a little hill. <coughs> um, so we, we were actually uh, using that opportunity to, to play with the, uh, the, the, um, the sloping landscape and use that in order to make the openings for the entrance of the car park and the, uh, the bicycle parking. And what we did was to introduce on top of all these movements a bridge in order to bring a higher square to the side so that you could also connect it to a program what could intensify the ground, but I will explain that later. But let's go back to this idea of time traveling and the time machine condition where we were so fascinated in. And the idea of the transfer um, location turn, turning in a time uh, transfer location was, was um, the fascination. And that we would deal with a site, as you can see in quite a green uh, city we have here on the one hand of uh, Arnhem, on this side of our, uh, the river, um, but a quite in intense uh, city on this side where we dealt with so many aspects of uh, the complexity of this side related to all these Brazilian discussions we had in the beginning of the city. Whereas after, after a lot of political discussions where um, um, also there where you have to imagine not only the government was involved uh, because of subsidiaries, but the regional, uh, pol political regional uh, forces were involved, also the local uh, city was of course uh, being involved, even um, um, uh, uh, some European funds were connected to this uh, project. So apart from all the parties being involved, we had to melt a lot of uh, difficulties here together with an ambition of a city who wanted to be the center between two economical areas. And that was the Ruhrgebiet, on the one hand in Germany, and on the other hand the Randstad in, in Holland. And with the high-speed uh, train, what is actually not so going so fast in Holland, pity enough, but it will uh, go faster uh, in, an, in a few years' time. With this new high-speed train, Arnhem thought to be um, then in the future having a better connection to the way how they could uh, expect more uh, visitors coming um, to, to their place. And, and don't forget, Arnhem is a place where a lot of um, cultural forces, are, apart from economical forces, also cultural forces are happening. Um, a sit, it's a, 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 an interesting blossoming of a city with, with um, one of the most interesting fashion schools um, to be found, etc. But one of the other arguments was for the, for the train station to intensify the ground in order to stimulate with that public transport. And that was another argument towards uh, the politicians to, to make sure that public transport was integrated in such a, in such a system that, that in a clockwise planning strategy that the site would become much more lively as it was before. Because 
the Arnhem site used to be almost the backyard of the city. It used to be very negative. People didn't want to walk around the train station after nine o'clock because it was, it was not lively enough, it was not visited. And by intensifying the location, we found ways to make sure that it would create an, 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 a clockwise series of activities related to uh, what we called slow program. So slow program in the areas where uh, we had some, um, some housing uh, planned and, and uh, work and, and some quicker programs related to all the activities related to the, the uh, infrastructure not around the uh, transfer um, part of the, of the site. But, but in this system, we, as I maybe fully, uh, not fully had explained, but, but in the system we had all these different clients to work with, and that's why, why the project took such a long time. We had almost close to eight to nine different clients who worked with us on, on a parking phase, parking garage in, in two phases, and, uh, well, the transfer hall, the, 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 the balcony connecting the transfer hall with the upper square to its the offices, etc. And that meant with all these different entities, uh, we, we had to face the project in such a way and hold the project so together that over the time that we would still have an enormous amount uh, of possible flexibility within the organization of the, of the site. Um, and you have to imagine that by doing the analysis of the central part of the location, we discovered all kinds of other difficulties, that the amount of people moving from the city centre towards the train station were blocked by this road. So we made a uh, short tunnel underneath here. Actually, it's a part of the earlier uh, project in phase one, what we started and changed some of the aspects of widening this uh, bridge, for instance, for the high-speed train, in order to then start with the other phases of the project uh, on this side uh, there. And the key principles of where we worked were, with uh, were connected to the idea of what we call um, the large-scale design models of the site. Um, and let me explain it through these V's, these V's uh, carrying the program over the whole length of the location. The V's are, are V walls. Um, you have to imagine that they, they collapse all the columns from the different programmatic entities. You have to make parking at the bus station and then uh, a conference room um, offices, as I, I mentioned and then tower on this side on a very small plot. So that, that was the difficulty, but who's carrying also uh, partly is partly, I'm sorry, is partly carried here by also, also this one wall. <coughs> that meant that all these column systems of the dis different programs, they could not be connected to each other. They would not support each other. So we needed to invent a total new constructive system with these V walls in order to carry all these uh, programs into one gesture. But by the light, could come deeper down into uh, the parking area, even air. Um, the infrastructure could move uh, from the lower part up from the parking towards the bus station, the, the, the transfer location, and then also even to the upper level of the, of the offices. But these fees are carrying over the full length all these programs and in a quite consistent manner over the, over the more calmer side, as I mentioned, in the location. But when it comes down to the more infrastructural side, then the walls, they, they split themselves up in order to carry a few other elements on the location. You can see here the, the, the stairs and the, the way how daylight comes quite deep into the site. This is an other element in the, in the transfer location where the V-balls underneath here carry um, a major uh, central column to have the opportunity here to have a, on this side of the, uh, the transfer hall to have a conference room and um, is carried by, by, by not only the V-wall underneath here 
and then carries a part of the roof. But a similar other element is this uh, um, twist, this twisting column, what carries almost all the other columns in this, uh, in this transfer hole in order to make everything as transparent as possible and open and, and as visual as, as, and clear as possible for all the visitors moving to the, the transfer uh, location. So this idea of stretching up the phenomenon of the station was further on developed in, in the whole concept of uh, um, using the right tools and the production techniques and the digital uh, fabrication strategies in order to, to make this all work into one system. And as I mentioned, they, they were connected to this principle of, of design models where we had worked with already for a while, like, like the, the, the idea of how a design model um, could uh, be tested from one project to the other and then slowly become a better entity in the network of uh, possibilities in the system of where we were working in was similarly used in this, um, in this, uh, um, in this whole site. And, and let me explain how that operates, because these design models are to be seen as bigger details in the project. They work as, as large details to carry the most important ambitions of the project. I've always believed that with a site like this or with a, with a project on this scale, you, you cannot have uh, 30 ambitions. They will never be recognized and visible and they would not also operate well um, in controlling the complexity of, of, an, uh, of, of a site like this and with the system you have to operate. So, so the phenomenon of this design, this model or the bigger detail, is not only the only element where the, the, the project is working with, um, but it connects all the other uh, systems within the way how the building comes together. It's, it's the way how we operate in UN Studio. We call it our, our ecosystem of how knowledge is transported from one knowledge platform to the other knowledge, knowledge platform, and then move slowly into innovations related to these design models, as I mentioned here. And, and this is quite a complex story. Uh, if we want to go into a discussion about it later on, for instance, then, then, then I'm happy to, because it's, uh, it's the essence of how we have developed our work. And I can explain it maybe through um, how we thought about these design models, because we, when, in the time when we started to work with um, single surface um, systems, like, like within the Möbius uh, house, for instance, or in the in the Mercedes-Benz Museum, where the trifold organization of a trifold um, system of a service, what is going from the inside to the outside, is carrying the whole system of the construction, we discovered that all the other systems we had worked with before, from the grid to the um, equal potential grid to the pointed grid, um, that, that mathematical service could carry much more qualities and incorporate much more qualities than, than the systems we, we uh, were used to uh, work with. And, and you have to understand that, for instance, I mean, it's the best to explain that if you cross your arms and you, you or you cross, let's say, a piece of paper, like the, the organization of the Möbius structure, and you hold it in your hand, then it can support itself, it can, it can carry itself. It, it is a geometrical system, but is actually also quite constructive. What you can't say about the grid system. So, so over the years, we became far more fascinated in these ideas, in order to see how, with a minimal gesture, like a reductive system, you could generate an incredible amount, um, or you could incorporate an incredible amount of complexity uh, and, and, and forces into it, whereby you could. Uh, invent suddenly a total new organizational system. Um, <clears throat> like, for instance, in the cyber service system of the, uh, the, the Arnhem train station roof and the column, they are, they are so organized that the, the forces are only going through the edges of the surface. So the surface is not doing very much. It's not carrying so much forces. It's more the edges 
um, and you know the so bubble uh, uh, philosophy of where Fry Otto already worked with, and, and some of his colleagues in in the time uh, they were doing their experiments, but. It's, it's not so much only the, the soul bubble strategy alone of uh, where the string is taking up the force, but it's also the way how you bend them, as you can see in this uh, structure. The twist is carrying almost an, 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 a span of close to 65 meters on one, on one side of the, the hole and another 35 to 40 meters on the other side through a very simple uh, gesture in the, in the middle of this... Uh, uh, station. And here you can see some of these tests and, and earlier ideas in the 90s, we're talking about the 90s here, where 3D modeling was still a bit kind of uh, unusual. Um, but we, we developed our own programs in the time in order to make sure that we could make these ideas work. So, so as I said, there were only a few Mm, larger details we worked with, and I explained already the V-models, the cuts in the landscape. The climb bottle surface was, was further developed in the idea of that you would have mo a movement of people coming from the higher level onto the side and then be pulled back into the side. was a more conceptual model about the flow, but was also later on transformed in the idea of moving an almost box-like organization to a, a more kind of softer organization, whereby um, the, the more softer side of the organization dealt more with the infrastructure and the more box-like organization dealt with more with the calmer programs on the side. So the transformative aspect of movement and programmatic entities was supported by the, by, by the action of the, of the geometry and the forms on the side. And that's maybe the key of the way how we work with, with these design models. They, they are not... The, the most important in the form itself, but what they can do are the, are the most important arguments uh, I will uh, maybe uh, later also like to discuss with you. In, in the time when we were doing all these, uh, call it the first parametric studies, in, um, in the late 90s, um, we discovered that, that, that through the direction of all these different um, levels of data you had to collect on the side from user groups um, towards how the user groups use uh, accessibility on the side or the public part of the site in time were the fascinations we uh, planned or, or projects with. So, so it was not only the Arnhem train station where we used these uh, what we call the deep planning strategies of parametric systems um, in our projects, but later on it, it, it was possible also because Arnhem was not finished, we were able to test that over other projects uh, as well, like for instance the, uh, the Mercedes-Benz Museum, etc. But, but in the early <coughs> uh, phase of the project, these were the, the, the flow studies of all the people moving through the site. So yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I can pick one, but for instance this was the movement from the people moving from the city um, towards the train station, this was the tunnel, people moving to the bus station, the, uh, the, the trolley bus station, and, and these were done again, the movements between the people coming from the, the, the waiting area station towards the bus station. So all these movements were pulled in a three-dimensional model in order to discover where and how we could place the column in the side so that we would have not any kind of wayfinding elements in the, in, in the transfer hall was our argument, but that, that the, the slopes of the site and the visual connections for going from one side to the other side was the, the, the transfer location would give you the opportunity to move around the central column. So, so in a way the architecture was here supporting the wayfinding instead of uh, that science had to do uh, the wayfinding. And that really works on the side. I mean, you have to go for that to the station, but I can promise you the, the architecture supports more wayfinding than the signs. Um, and then, of course, the twist. Um, I have to be careful with my voice. That's why Cola helps me. Okay. Um, the twist was, of course, the key 
to 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 support that notion of wayfinding, so that 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 you would almost follow the key uh, the twist in the way how it would orient yourself, and and that's why maybe in mathematical uh, in the mathematical world of services, it's it's quite nice that one can talk about orientable and non-orientable services. You should look it up because it's quite interesting. The, already, the situationists were fascinated in this idea of orientable and non-orientable services. So. I'm not the uh, first one who invents these ideas. There is a history related to that. But, but in, during the whole process of um, transforming the ideas from, from the digital production towards the, the, um, uh, the, the manufacturing of the, um, the production of the, of the steelwork, what was early on thought in concrete, actually that's quite, uh, quite uh, maybe interesting that we in the beginning thought that we could do everything in concrete, like with the Erasmus Bridge in Rotterdam, but then, uh, then later on we discovered that we could make everything much uh, more slender and, and, and could make the spans much wider in steel than in uh, concrete and actually um, we had an uh, a budget uh, discussion. We had to be fast with this last part of the project. We had only two years to build the, the transfer location. So we built the, the hall in different segments on maybe close to five different locations in order to uh, make it work as, as, as uh, uh, quick as uh, possible. These were the, the prefab elements we, we were testing and, and, and checking in the first phase of the project. And here you see how then all these different elements over the time, time came together while constructing and bringing all these elements to the side. This is the foot of the, of the, the, the twist with the, the bicycle parking underneath there. And then carries the whole... Um, um, distorted grid, as we can see here, um, um, uh, of the roof. Yeah, and then if you, if you come from the... Uh, maybe I explained it. If you come from the bus station or you come from the city centre, then you can see the twist is always guiding you. This is the bridge going to that higher level in the, in the side. This lady is not allowed to walk here with her bike, but, but you can. <laughs> she should go underneath there. <laughs> she lost her way, actually, strange enough. Um, but but th this is the, uh, the whole system of how you then come into the, uh, to, to the hall. You have a, a panorama of all the entities of going to the trains, um, going to the entrance of the car park, which you immediately will see the the taxis who stand here on the high level. Actually, the, the idea was also that the taxis in the night and the people walking around that side of the location would always be able to look into the hall for safety. I mean, safety, um, you know that safety um, aspects become far more, far more important over the last years in, in train stations than ever before. And that was actually one of the uh, arguments. We could also make this open transfer location in, uh, in Arnhem. Um, so that was the stretched image, and this is the, the way how you see it, and all coming uh, together in the way how how this uh, twist works together with the way how daylight is guiding you. I said that the services were guiding you, so that you would move easily from one service on a higher level, in sometimes a three or four percent angle, but the light. Uh, uh, openings are doing that maybe even more uh, in the way how you move uh, in, in the side. And I forgot to say that over these years we had, of course, the opportunities to test these, these double curved surfaces and these mathematical surfaces in so many different ways. Like this is the, um, the Graz Music Theater in Austria, where we built it in concrete and we discovered so many unusual difficulties and interesting innovations in the same time together with the engineers we worked with. Like for instance, this, this structure is pumped up um, uh, with the concrete bottom up. So it's not pulled down, but it's pumped up in order to have not to, uh, that we would have not too much gravel in the concrete underneath this surface. 
And in the same time, other projects from Villa NM and of course, mainly again, of course, the Mercedes-Benz Museum were the projects we could uh, test these ideas in. So stretching all these phenomena gave, gave us the opportunity to rethink mobility in a totally different manner. Um, but also the phenomenon of the object, and, and you, we all know now lately Graham Harmon talking about the third table in the sense that he says that it is so interesting of the third table that, that you don't have to think of the table as, an, as a mathematical object where all the, the molecules are part of the system of the table or that what you do with the table, that you can write on the table or whatever, but that it is the beauty of the intensity of the object, what is the power of the table. And, and in a way he says it's all these aspects of the table what makes it so beautiful that, that what it can do. And in a similar way I've always liked the idea of that, that you can work with flows and directionality of uh, the computational and, and many aspects of, of uh, the way guiding uh, knowledge in many directions, but the intensity of the object is the most important in order to make things uh, work, so that, the, so, that, so that the architecture becomes an instrument instead of an object alone, and that it guides you and that it directs you and that it attracts, like with this way of, as I explained, the way how the light from a wider uh, ceiling of light moves to a smaller ceiling of light and, and, and orients you through the space, as you can see here. And where also the object becomes highly interactive between the people using the construction um, here on this uh, platform and whereby maybe the, the, the mobility of the construct we have made here is also making a public construct between the people using it. As, as we know from so many stations, this is a wonderful image of the Waterloo station, uh, a poster what was made in the time when it was opened, and, and of course um, here the station was a quite straight uh, organized uh, station, um, so where people were not so much guided in a particular direction, uh, but, but the liveliness of it and the, and the diversity and, and the world of um, Mm, of the city, what becomes suddenly visible, like we even soldiers who were moving around to, to this after the war, I think, uh, who are part of this uh, uh, liveliness of the station, was one of the ambitions where we are after. So it's maybe this, this aspect of the theater um, and the theatrical and the notion of the uplifting qualities we were fascinated in when we designed the station. I mean, when, when do we find a station today where we think that it is uplifting and celebrates this idea of leaving and seeing your friend again and, and, and supporting the principle of, um, of that, you, that you're happy to leave or to enjoy that you come into an, a new, new site, for instance. These are the aspects we wanted to pick up uh, in this project. And um, for that reason, it is a project where um, Luckily enough, uh, already many people said to us they're happy to uh, come back to. You see, here's um, a, bit, a bit in a kind of a quick uh, movie um, how all the movements operate, and particularly how, the, how intense these bus stations operate. This is the conference room I talked about. Only one for Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi element. <laughs> so I, I I leave it here. Thanks. Thanks very much. A little more. Okay, I'll start it off. And then. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> One of the many important things uh, about this project, which I think really repays thought, it was expressed actually not about this, but the other day 
uh, a PhD student in supervision said, which I think is absolutely true, uh, we actually kind of lack a way of representing the city in the sense that sort of on the one side we have cartography and we know the cartography has limitations to kind of grasping the nature of the city. And on the other side, like we have the plan, which might be fine for a building, but you know, isn't so good on the city. And she said, well, there's always been this kind of uh, gap where the city, and especially so when you consider the fact of motion. Because, as it were, now it's very important that I make myself clear here, I'm not talking about representing somehow the city with lots of figures kind of walking around. So what is, you know, the motion of the city? It's, it's certainly not actually, which is sometimes confused with, like circulation. Uh, I mean, I think in many ways you got an answer or towards an answer. If you think about it, um, what you're talking about is really, you know, partly given in the notion of routes that, that someone will or will not take, you know, which are already mapped in some sense as part of the design. In that sense, let me just sort of give one more detail about the student's presentation. She said, I think there are representations of the city, but we don't really notice them as such because they appear to us as simply objects of use. Take, for example, the underground map. The underground map is a terrible piece of cartography, I mean, in the cartographic sense, but everyone agrees it's absolutely brilliant. What it enables you to do is to get on and say, I have to get off in three stops time. Therefore, it's not, in, it's not usefully considered as a specialized form of representation. It's something which has a performative element to it. it it's used. Now, in that sense, it, I, mean, I think the originality of, of the project and of how Ben describes it is because really the formulation would come, it seems to me, out of your presentation, that the representation of the city comes about through architecture. I mean, you know, you're, you're not looking for some sort of classical notion of representation in which the representation is independent of the object it's representing and where we think it does it accurately or not. The whole question of a sort of motion mobility is given here uh, in the form really of ultimately architectural form. And that seems to me, a, you know, a really uh, pressed, pushed to that kind of level. Uh, it begins to have a way of thinking out its originality. So, I mean, I was really just trying to, to put it, because I think, you know, then you can see much more. I mean it enables us to track back historically. Uh, and in a funny way, you know, when you said about greeting and saying goodbye, um, those are phenomena which have always been incredibly successfully uh, managed by the railway station. 
and appallingly managed by airports. Uh, but this is actually, it's not a question of, you know, the narratives of departure and arrival. It, it, those two are kind of like roots. And the whole movement of the train out of the station uh, is an extremely successful kind of so I think your, your, your project also gives the possibility of opening up kind of historical investigations. Okay, I've gone on too long and I, now I turn to you to ask Ben questions, but also to respond to the project in your own terms. Have we got a microphone? Hello. Hi. Um, I guess I just wanted to maybe stimulate a bit more discussion about how the process of the design of the station is actually linked to how it performs as the formal space. Um, from, from my own analysis of the process of design of the station, one could say that, as you alluded in the talk, but I think it would be nice to hear you talk about it a bit more, that there is a kind of an indirect relationship between the diagrams and the kind of exigencies of flow and movement in the station and the, the way these diagrams are then uh, actualized in form. Um, you're not simply translating, you're not simply incorporating the needs of the transfer knot, you also inventing the pattern of movement by imposing either the Klein bottle or the V model onto the diagrams. And it wasn't just me, but also I believe Patrick Schumacher made an argument um, in his writings that it's actually a very non-linear design process that leads from the so-called initial analytical, like the network analysis mm. diagrams and intersecting cones, to this incredible twisted and continuous surface. So I guess what is interesting to note, it, and I think I see that, I've only seen the station in the process of its construction, when I see it as a final space, I think that there is another effect of the formal decisions and the models you've transplanted on the way we move and the way we feel and the way we interact with the space. So it's interesting relationship between program, diagram, and the formal model, which I think is an interesting discussion overall in contemporary mm -hmm. architecture, because oftentimes we assume that diagrams are somehow translated into form. And it's not this mm. case in your work. It, there's an amazing relationship back and forth. So I was wondering, maybe you've noticed mm. that, or perhaps mm. in other projects it might have had an effect as well. Yeah, nice. Mm, yeah, no, you're correct that that, um, that that there is, of course, a fascination with the diagram already for a long time in the work. Uh, but as we always said, um, diagrams are just, if you are interested in working with diagrams, they are, they are just free tools to, to give you the opportunity to, to be non-representational with the way how you move from an idea to a form. Sometimes a diagram give you, can give you only an organizational idea, an infrastructural idea. Um, and then you have to uh, instrumentalize it towards the way how you can make that work. Um, so that's the first thing I'd like to say, but, but, but um, there's a major difference between uh, Patrick Schumacher's uh, interesting pa parametric design than mine. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you know, I know that you're not... Patrick wrote a piece... Uh, I know, I know, I know. He wrote, he wrote a piece on Arnhem. You know, that's nice that you know that. Um, he, he was incredibly interested in the, in the Arnhem train station in the early 90s and, and he write, wrote a beautiful piece, so nothing negative about him and his theories. But, but I've always believed that it is important to know where you edit information, where, where do you direct it, where do you um, guide uh, the right information in the parametric model, because you can have an eight-dimensional system of many layers of information coming to several points in the design, but if you don't know how to control it, then, then every form can go everywhere. 
And I'm interested in this idea of disciplining uh, geometries. So find arguments in the way what can what can what can a geometry do? Like in the phenomenon of the the, the transfer hall, the twist was not you know, I mean the twist was kind of an architectural argumentation towards the way how we could solve a lot of uh, infrastructural difficulties there on the side. So that it gave a lot of transparency on the location because we had only one column who, whereby we could pull out in the whole location close to 100 columns in the whole site because there is no other column there. So it gave an enormous amount of possibilities to make it as transparent as possible this, for this station, for the transfer location. But another aspect is uh, related to the whole time-space condition that you can find in the train station. And you have to, for that reason, you have to be there. I, can't, I couldn't film it. And that is that you walk all the time in curves. And that's the most exciting aspect of the station, that you can always look back to where you came from, that you, that you walk towards the people you can see back in the way how you move from one side to the other side. And if you're on the higher level or on the lower level, you have the feeling that the space-time condition, like Gideon write, wrote about it, where Le Corbusier was so fascinated in, whereby everything was seen as a camera, so 2.5D is not happening in the station there. It's there as if spaces are following you. So the spaces are in, an, in a kaleidoscopic manner, be there, they're so there that as if you are in one time, of, you are many times in, 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 how to say that, you are there in many times in the, at the same time, sorry. You are many times at the same time. And that's a, a, a phenomenon of a space-time condition where I'm far more fascinated in, because that's, that's belonging to our culture today. So, so you're right. The, the, the way how we deal with this, um, these, these, these design models in order to control the parametric system, they, they are quite intense in what they control. Infrastructure, space, times, they, they deal with the phen phenomenon of um, maybe new formal architectural strategies, etc. So you're right. And again, it seems to me that there's a very kind of important thing in what you just said about the curves. I mean, if you turn that point over to looking at it from the kind of psyche of the subject who's kind of using the space, it seems to me it hangs on the question of orientation, mm. which becomes absolutely kind of vital. Uh, and, and we know there's a problem about the relationship between cartography and orientation. Um, I mean, Kant observes that you may have a map, but unless you know kind of where you are, it's not a lot of use. Uh, those of you about a certain age will recall that in Paris, there used to be maps, actually, I think in Plaster of Paris, uh, in the metro which would have a red arrow uh, pointing to the station you were in. And uh, at the side of it, it would be written, Vous êtes ici. But then, actually, if the map was quite old, you could see generations, almost as though this was a miraculous shrine, of people touching their kind of finger to it. Obviously thinking, yes, but where am I? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm here, but where's here? Uh, and then you could often see often people nip up one floor to the street level to kind of look around at where, and then they'd go back to the map to see where it was referring to. So there's obviously something traditionally, you know, problematic about cartography, the city, and orientation. And, and this seems mm. like, uh, in a way, at a human level, to really kind of roll the issue backwards. I mean, you know, one has only to think of how conservatives have always denounced a certain kind of modernist or modern or contemporary architecture because they claim it's disorienting. Mm -hmm. 
uh, even if they're normally kind of wrong. But this, this is, I mean, this is using architecture to reorient without, in a sense, it being one of the normal instruments of orientation. Mm. I think this gentleman was asking questions. I, I suddenly had a realization that, uh, of something that's strange that I remember in my childhood when I was five or six. I suddenly so realized that we actually lived on the surface of the earth rather than in the earth. For some reason before that, I'd imagined that we lived in the earth. Perhaps I grew, I grew up in a very mountainous region, so perhaps that was it. But what this suddenly, well, I suddenly realized <laughs> this project is, or is, is, it's a landscape project. Mm. And it's a multi, and what you've done is you just brought the landscape into multi -level, multiple levels. Yeah. And um, you've increased the surface area of the Earth, in effect. Um, so it's just just very interesting that, that, that we, we, see, we see a lot of landscape projects now, and it's uh, and, and it's very exciting. But to suddenly create a mountainous landscape in Holland is quite interesting. I, uh, <laughs> because you never know when you left the planet's surface, how do you? When you're wandering around these ramps. No, but I, you're right. I mean, it's actually. I mean, there, I mean, there is, it's also a bit connected to maybe an earlier question about what what do you do with program diagramming, etc. Because, but 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 your question could be also connected to the the fascination of where um, architects like uh, Ferrillo and um, Perrin were fascinated in in the phenomenon of the oblique. You know, the, the, the idea of how you could stimulate movement through diagonal forces so that you can activate movement with that. Um, of course, I mean, that's all in there. Um, and uh, you have to really uh, understand that, that maybe, maybe it's right, you know, that, that maybe as a Dutchman, you, you know, you start to love more <laughs> mountain, than, mountain conditions than, than anyone else. I, I actually, I believe, honestly, that architecture started there where the mountains made, made the, the first architecture, of course, I mean. Um, they are older than any architecture. So you could be inventor of the Dutch Alps. <laughs> yeah, I think we gave them away or something like that. Yeah, I, we did do something stupid there. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm interested because you, you obviously you've taken 20 years and condensed it into 30 minutes there. Um, and what is, I'm interested in the evolution of this project because you know, 20 years ago, even with deep planning, you couldn't have foreseen um, the situation 20 years later from the, the way that parametrics is, um, modeling is so different, uh, the way that public transport is so much more <coughs> important to the urban environment. What, what really changed during the process of this this whole project, uh, and did anything surprise you? Yeah, m not so many things changed, but but you. Mm. Of course, I mean the difficulty in the process was that um, that sometimes the 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 different like for instance there is a commercial aspect also related to the the whole subsidies uh, system of the project, like like the towers, like uh, the the towers were supposed to be a bit lower. In the side, and um, I, w I was always scared about the height of the towers. But then later on, we we liked it because the city was planning a far more denser side around the train station after they had seen the towers uh, and the whole development of the train station area in order to improve um, the whole yeah, like I said, the whole area around the train station because that area, you know, Arnhem was heavily bombed. And it was actually uh, built very quickly after, for certain parts in the city centre after the war. So there is still so much to, to reconstruct on that side. So, so that's one thing about the towers. Maybe other elements were related to that. Uh, yeah, that, that of course we could not foresee that it would take 20 years. <coughs> we thought that it was going to take us 12 years or 15 years. And, and there were difficulties in the period when we, um, when we worked with all these political parties getting certain aspects of the project uh, uh, um, from the ground, like the whole public uh, space. I didn't talk about the public space because they're really well done by 
by um, an architect uh, we worked with, um, landscape architect we worked with in, in such a wonderful way that uh, that we wanted to get it done and and in the in the way materialized we we all were standing for even the city was was supporting it and, and it took a long time to get the finances for that project uh, done etc so but if you go back to the original drawings you i mean you can really look at the original drawings and original intentions of the project most of what we were designing there and bringing together into to the master plan is built as we build it and I think it had to do also with, uh, with the fact that, what I said, that the, the V-walls, they allowed for the possibility to, to uh, introduce a third floor onto, uh, not as, uh, two floors only, on, the, on top of the bus station, but three floors. So that was another change, but, but so there was a lot of flexibility in the system, luckily enough. That's what I'm saying. I, I wanted to ask a question about uh, when I look at that space, I feel like I'm sort of a, a human being in, as fluid that's moving through the space. And earlier on, you talked about Houston Station and uh, Grand Central, which are very much boxes in which you've arrived. And, and therefore, is there a moment where there is the pleasure of stopping or are you, is the pleasure only when you're moving? And, and you don't... There seems to be like bicycles moving and people moving, and it's all about the the experience of transit rather mm. than the experience of pausing. It's like sometimes you would just like to be able to stop, but you feel like you might be in the way of of the of the flow. And yeah. is there like little pockets that are for stopping and waiting and waiting for a friend? Or I don't. <coughs> I, can you explain about that? Yeah, that's that a good kind question. of. Uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, actually, what I didn't fully explain, and that's why I wanted to have more questions than, than I'm talking here, because I'm, it's such a large-scale project that, that you, there are so many details you can talk about for, uh, for uh, you know, longer than an hour. Um, the whole central hall works as a waiting space for the people who uh, transfer from one station to the other, but there are places where you can wait um, for, the, for your bus, or for the train. And uh, also, um, there is one central sign, so one board telling you not only there where you can go for the train, but also for the buses. So that's, that's, I think that is maybe the most essential aspect of the transfer hall, is that it guides the people in the right complex direction of where to move from one entity to the other. But the most yeah, essential is that you can also weigh that. Because I mean, before also, if you before if you would come out of the train station and you would go and take a bus, you would just only stand in the rain, or even on the on the platforms there were no kind of roofs there, you know, in 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 the in the, in the early nineties. So that that is mainly the reason also why we were getting uh, all the parties on board to do this transfer hall. Yeah. So, yeah. I actually have, have a question. Um, I really liked when you started the le lecture, you showed the picture of Grand Central and the painting of Houston Station, and you were kind of talking about how stations were often captured mm. in the media and, um, and in kind of popular culture. And since this was a project that, you know, you had to like have some future foresight of what it was going to be like when it was eventually built, I was wondering how you thought this experience could be captured um, going forward in the future, because it's such a three-dimensional and sculptural project. I mean, even film sometimes, like, even in the film you showed, it didn't capture everything about, like, the quality of the materiality and everything. So I was just quite curious about how you envisioned that being p part of this tradition of stations in... Well, like I said, the, you know, for me, the, the most exciting about the, the, the station is that it supports a bit the, the notion of being bit more uplifted and, and, and that it is that it plays with the theater uh, like like uh, you know like maybe walking <coughs> walking in a curve and then maybe seeing yourself walking from the from from different corners of the station and where many people can can see each other and look at each other is for me the most exciting part of celebrating that phenomenon of um, 
you know, hopefully uh, the future of the station. And, and there is an enormous discussion in Holland going on anyway about uh, public mm -hmm. transport. And, 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 and maybe I didn't emphasize it enough, but the idea that we were able on, an, on a very small ground, 40,000 square meters, to introduce the, uh, a, a program of close to 160,000 square meters to create a work environment, living environment, and, and to make a site whereby so many people being so close to the station can, can then, uh, what's the hope, then also support this liveliness around the station, but also then use the station a bit more, is, is, is now um, actually further supported also in Holland. I, I don't know if you know that, but the station in Rotterdam, in Amsterdam, in Breda, in Utrecht, they're all going in, in, uh, in, the, in the in new transformation systems whereby they, um, they, they picked up this whole political idea of intensifying um, not only the ground, but particularly uh, public transport. Yeah, so, so but, but in a way, hopefully, that we can uh, um, uh, um, rethink the station in a whole, whole new way, like we hopefully did here. Okay, is there anyone else who would like to <coughs> make a contribution? Well, I have a question regarding your relationship to the companies that, <coughs> excuse me, I have a question, question regarding the, your relationship to the companies that run the railroads themselves. Yeah. Um, I have not heard much about it. Can, can you say something useful? There's a lot of discussion in Holland about the nature of these companies. Should they be public or not? And, and just how... Oh, you know that well. Are they... Um, are they... Uh, you know, how, how should they be tied into such so big projects as they, these? They are in trouble. You know that, probably. Yeah. Because, I mean, it sounds like if you know about it. And, and uh, they are in trouble because the the... There is so much competition coming onto the rail system right now in Holland. It's not only pro-rail. Pro-rail is the government-oriented uh, uh, um, company. But there are now other companies also, um, they are allowed to have their um, trains running uh, through, through Holland in order to, uh, to create more competition in, in, the, in this whole uh, um, transport system. But strange enough, uh, I had an incredible uh, support from ProRail on this project. I, they, they, after, of course, it took a few years, it took three years, four years, in order to get them convinced to, do, to introduce this uh, transfer location. Um, but they liked the idea that they, would, that they would go beyond the traditional idea of that they would have their image of their own station for pure alone the trains. But my question was really, how was the relationship? You said you were very supportive, but were they involved? And, and yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and in what sense were they involved? Oh, they, I mean, they were in the whole design process, uh, there on the table with more, more uh, members uh, than, uh, than uh, even from my team. <laughs> Um, and even more members on the table than even the city. So they were heavily involved, heavily, yeah. But, but I, I, don't, I don't think that maybe says so much because that, that is maybe in any institutional organization sometimes the case that, that, yeah, that it is maybe overmanaged. But in the beginning specifically, it was quite overmanaged. And later on, when the project was running after, after maybe 10 years, then, then the amount of people and the management was less dense and they gave us the full trust to, do the, to make the station as we did it. But, you know, I'm not talking here about my, myself alone, but I'm talking also about all the other architects who had a similar process over the last 10 years. You know, there is an, an architect uh, called, uh, an office called uh, Bente McCrowell. They designed almost three or four, three stations in Holland whereby they went through a similar process where I went through. So it's quite traditional. Mm -hmm. It's very Dutch. You know, very, you know, everyone is on the table. Everyone talks to each other as long as we, and, and if not a decision is made, then you can't leave the room, something like that. So my impression is that you really appreciated their contribution, right? Yeah, yeah. It, w it wasn't very much conflict or anything. No, no, no. no it's also not my, my belief. That I'm not the architect who believes to say, this is my design and this is what you have to buy. Otherwise, I'm out or something like that. That's why, you know, that's not how I believe architecture can operate today. 
No. Architecture needs to be really fully integrated with all the specialists uh, and all the members on the table in, in order to make an intelligent design. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Tiny. one there, oh. and then, sorry, and then come back. Yes. Oh. So you mentioned wayfinding and how the twist in particular eliminates the need for wayfinding in a way and that you want, it seems like you're arguing for architecture to be that signifier rather than having signs plastered all over a building or placed yeah. in a building. Would you say that parametric design or this type of design, if we call it parametric design, is a way to do that? And would you argue that architecture should be moving in that direction or is it just something that can occasionally happen in a case like this where, I mean, they still put signs into the train station, but without it, it would have still worked. I, I would argue that it would work as a signifier without the signs. But you know, yeah, many things are just true what you say. You can with parametric, or with, let's say with working with many levels of uh, data, information, you can of course analyze much more the, ef the efficiency of of, of the complexity of many models than ever before. Like uh, what we did already in the 90s was uh, calculating uh, with, with the city engineers of where and how people were moving and then pull that into an, in a, in a, what we call the channeling system, like a, a tube, as you saw in the diagram, so where people would move. So, so that gave us a whole new way of just looking at numbers alone. So we learned to visualize the numbers. And that's a whole new way of working, um, what, what, uh, what was never done before, like the diagram I showed you about the deep planning where, where a question was about. Um, that, that was an, a diagram we, we produced for a site we analyzed around Grand Central Station and Penn Station. We discovered that the, the, the difficulty of Grand Central Station, or oh no, Penn Station was that it was not lively enough. There was not enough program around the, the, the Penn Station and still is a major problem station, as we all know. If you come out, out of Madison Square Garden, then you feel totally lost in, in, the, in the station after nine o'clock in the evening. Uh, but, but, but so we visualized all that information of all, that, all these data in Manhattan um, in order to, uh, to have a healthy dialogue with the engineers about where people would move and where you could uh, bring in more program on the side. So, so um, that is my argument also in the way you can work with infrastructures that you can then start to argue or find ways where you can introduce what type of program on the side in order to make it all either lively or less lively there where you want that. So, so yeah, the same you can do with wayfinding. Uh, architecture can actually support wayfinding instead of doing that by science alone. And you cannot do it in ev every building, sorry. You cannot do that in every building, but for instance, uh, um, I don't know if you've been in the Mercedes-Benz Museum, but it's all about the, the, the almost natural way of how you walk down in a double spiral and you don't, you know, you don't have to follow a sign. You, you, you know, you, you fall into the exit, if you want. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize, it would sound a little bit out of order because I, I had a tiny question that was following up on the previous discussion about how the other agencies and collaborators would have affected the decisions of the project. And the tiny question I had uh, recently when you were talking at uh, Rice University during the judgment symposium, you yeah. made an argument that in fact an ar architect is, if I, if I, if I remember correctly, you call it trained judgment yes. that is developed by an architect actually working in collaboration, whether it's kind of deep analytically working with different analytical suppliers or whether it's the collaborators on a project and whether it's in fact a public agency or structural engineer or the local town user, you somehow made an argument that that gives, builds up a series of criteria by which the project then gets judged rather than the intuitive subjective judgments of the auteur. So I, I just had a question, perhaps that was something you were referring to when you said that no, it is something I develop as I, it's not if I don't offer a product, 
take it or leave it. I develop and I judge my own project through the eyes of the... I just thought maybe that's somehow related. Because that is a recent argument you've made. Yeah, you're right. Because that was the diagram also talking about how you bring not only through, let's say, data alone, how you bring your information into these, what I call the larger details of the project, but it's also in the way how the system works of the way how you collect information, how you interact with information and, and the information from specialists or everyone in, this, in the system of where you work with. So, you know, I'm, I'm there only directing that information and then guide it. But, but it's interesting that you come back to the phenomenon of uh, the discussion I had there with, with uh, the students also about trained judgment. Because I believe that design is a form of trained judgment. It's, it's, if you don't know how the information comes on what level, on the right level together, in order to make something work, you, you, you're over-intuitive. So there needs to be a kind of play between the in, intuition of why and how you guide information by developing, developing with that kind of control in the design system. And in the same time, you need to work with um, a certain amount of experience and it doesn't have to be your experience, but it can be the experience of someone who's much better in uh, um, the way how, let's say, um, a public flow and, and a cro crossover of uh, infrastructural movements uh, come together. I mean, there are specialists for that. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So I believe that trained judgment is related to the way how you learn with that to control or that you develop new concepts of control, maybe I should say. But control is so kind of a difficult uh, word when you talk about control and architecture. But you, today you have to find new ways and systems of control in order to, uh, to make the, uh, not only the ambitious work of the project, but also to, with these larger details, also to control, for instance, the budget. It, it sounds funny, but, but, but these larger details give you also the opportunities to control more than only architecture alone. Okay, <clears throat> there's no last question, in which case I'd, I think we should end and I'd like you to join with me in thanking Ben very much. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.